folks to uh, your, your Bibles to Jude. To Jude. It's only one chapter. It's one chapter. When you find it, say, I got it. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, 16 through 21, 24, 25. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. But there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into laxiviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 24, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Come on, give God a shout of praise right there. You may be seated. Father, thank you for your word in Jesus' name. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into laxiviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's verse 4. I want to use for teaching tonight threats from the inside. Threats from the inside. Somebody shout that out. Threats from the inside. This particular book is one of my favorite books. Of course, it's very short, so you can learn it when you're in grade school. However, Jude opens up talking to us, clearly stating what the book is about, who he is, and what he's trying to accomplish. But I love some things that he doesn't say. Jude does say that he's the brother of James, but he doesn't tell us that he's also the brother of Jesus. He's the half-brother of Jesus. They share the same mother, but they don't share the same father. But he does tell us that he is the brother of James. James, we know, goes on to be the central figurehead in Jerusalem at the church. James is not one of the 12. This James is not. James is one of Jesus' brothers. Jude is James' brother, but Jude is also Jesus' half-brother, but Jude 
leaves out in the writing that he is the half-brother of Jesus. It would seem to me that if I'm Jesus' brother, I'm going to let the world know Jesus is my brother, and I'm not going to put half. <laughs> I'm going to let the world know, yo, Jesus, the Christ, is my brother. But he doesn't do that. He leaves it out. I ask the question, why? Why would he leave out that he is the half-brother of Jesus? A couple of oral traditions, a couple of rabbinical teachings say that Jude wanted to make sure that we have the spiritual essence of their relationship first. That it's primary to know that he calls himself a slave of his own brother. He is a slave of Jesus Christ, which means that he has a spiritual relationship and he, he, he wants to not advertise, but make it more prominent that I worship him, he's in charge, I'm not, I'm showing up as his representative. That's one. Second, John chapter 7, I believe, in his verse 5 tells us that none of, brother, none of Jesus' brothers believed him. So it would be pretty harsh for me to say that I'm the brother of Jesus when the truth of the fact is I never believed him when he was in ministry. He doesn't come to Christ until resurrection. James nor Jude. But the beauty of the text is both of them still end up in the book. That is help for some of us who have denied who he is in our life. He was denied by his own brothers. There's other scriptures that talk about him, even Mark, I think Mark chapter 3, talks about how they thought he was out of his mind. So even Jesus' life demonstrates to us how to handle threats from the inside. Every threat is not always a threat of murder, but that particular threat to have people in your house that don't believe you is traumatic. To grow up one way and to discover who you are in God, to grow in wisdom, to grow in stature, with favor in God and man and your own family not believe. Not only does Jesus' brothers not believe who he is, his community doesn't. So Jesus is a prime picture of what it looks like to have threats within the home and within the community that he's brought up in. So Jesus teaches us how to be resilient when your own support doesn't believe in you. He shows us in Scripture, he says he could not do many miracles where he was because they did not believe. Not just the community, his own house. Threats from the inside. I thought about Adam and Eve. God creates this beautiful place for them to live in called Eden, and they have dominion and power over everything in it. But yet one of the creatures that he actually names is a threat from within inside. Because Eve does not necessarily know the scriptures. She's heard them, but she does not know them for herself. She hears what sounds like the word. And so she hears what sounds like the word, and then she believes that what she heard is the word. So she doesn't have the ability to, 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 to defend or even know if it is the word. So she believes what's not the word, and that word gets her evicted from what she had dominion over, the threat from the inside. Jesus talks to us about the sheep in the fold and, and that uh, his sheep knows his voice and a stranger they would not, they wouldn't listen to and that people that come in, they would have to come in another way because he's at the door. So if another shepherd ends up inside of the pen, it was a threat inside. We can't look down on any of our biblical characters because all of us have had to deal with internal threats that have dealt with us inside. If it stays in front of me, I'm okay with it. I can prepare for it. But the minute the threat enters my safety zone, 
it enters my comfort zone. Things now change because something had to be said, something had to be done in order for me to let my guards down. In order for me to allow you to sit with me and kill me, eat with me and kill me, me pay your bills and you kill me, me take you out and you kill me, me save you from bankruptcy and you kill me, something had to happen for me to let my guards down for the threat to come inside. And the purpose of our teaching tonight is to get you to understand why the threat came inside, how the threat came inside, and what to do when the threat has come inside. So Jude tells us, I am the brother. He doesn't tell us I'm the brother. He says, I'm the servant of Jesus Christ. He leaves it out, but he does tell us that he is connected to James, and he continues to read, but he says something to us. He says, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, here's where I want to park for a second. I want to kind of do this line by line, precept by precept. He says, I, I was doing something, and what's happening is so important that I got to stop, and I got to talk to you, because you are listening to something that is changing. The first thing he says is, I got to write to you because of this common salvation. Well, let's deal with that common salvation. He starts talking about the common salvation, and he starts connecting to them, telling them that whatever these people are that have crept inside, they're not bringing a new salvation. They're not bringing a new faith. So whatever it is that they're telling you, you've got to remember what you've been told from times past. This is what he's talking to them about. He's giving them history. So when we start talking about common salvation, then immediately it starts connecting to what Bishop has been teaching us. Because the process of faith starts at salvation. Now, when God designed us to believe or designed us to come into the earth, he made us with a space to desire him. A space to desire and to lean on something greater than us. So in Romans uh, chapter 10, 9 and 10, we hear it all the time. We got to confess with our mouth, believe with our heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and we can be saved. It tells us that with the heart, man does what? So with the heart, man's believe, but with the mouth, what? Confession is made known what? unto salvation. He says, this common salvation. So he says, with the heart, man believes. Now, this is critical for your understanding as Bishop continues to go on with this teaching, because the process of faith is established at salvation. How do we know that? Because he tells us, with the heart, man believes. Well, what is he believing? He's believing that God put himself in flesh, dropped himself in a virgin, and then was pregnant, got nine months pregnant, came into the world, never sinned, and he dies for us. You didn't see it. It happened over 2,000 years ago. You grew up hearing that 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. You did not see it. But something convinced you to do what? To believe it. You didn't see it, but you believe it. You didn't see it, but you believed it. You didn't see it, but you believe it. Not only did you believe it, you did what? You confessed it out of your mouth. That means you had the nerve to walk up in front of thousands of people or hundreds of people or five people and actually confess something that you did not see. If you can believe that a God would step in flesh, Impre the Holy Spirit would impregnate a woman, have a baby, still be a virgin, and then live 33 years, and then die for your sins, and then go back to heaven. Why can't you believe God for a headache to be healed? Why can't you believe God to turn around your finances? Why can't you believe God can fix your emotions? Why don't you believe God can't fix your marriage or fix your children? All you're doing is activating the process of salvation, this common salvation. So he's showing us. So when you look at this process of common salvation, I am believing in my heart. Your heart is not the pump. Your heart is your spirit. I'm believing in my heart. I'm confessing with my mouth 
And then I have to behave in a way that matches what I confessed. This is the process of faith. So the process of faith says basically that I have to believe, I've got to believe it in my heart, and then I have to do what? Confess. I have to confess it. So part of our problem is, number one, we'll say we believe it, and then we'll confess on the other side of the confession. What do I mean by the other side? When you confess a thing and you're saying, I believe the thing, you have to confess it as if you are believing it, all right? You don't confess it like you're not believing it or you're speaking against what you just confessed. So if I'm going to confess it, I confess it, and then I do what? Then I correspond with my actions. So I got this believing in the heart. I've got this next component, which means I'm confessing with my mouth. And then after I've confessed it with my mouth, then I act on it, all right? So when you're confessing it, you're saying, I believe it. With you confessing it, you're saying it is already done. And then when you get up, you're saying, I'm doing what I confessed. And what am I confessing? I'm confessing what he said. I'm not confessing what I said. I'm confessing what the Word of God said. So in this process of faith, if I'm going to walk by faith, then all Jude is saying the process has already been established, and whoever is coming in here trying to bring a new faith, there is no new faith. He says this faith has already been established, and the people that have come in, they have crept in unawares. Now, how does the ungodly come in unnoticed? How does the ungodly creep in unaware? So then the text says that certain men, so when the text says certain men, that means it was a certain group. The group has already been identified. It doesn't give us the name, but it does tell us that a certain group has already been identified. So in order for somebody to creep in on you unaware, that would simply mean that your focus is somewhere else. If your focus is somewhere else, that leaves a gap open for the enemy to come in and sift you like wheat because he sees you focus in another area. So it's just like the government. The government will tell you stuff on the news to get you occupied while they're working on something else right in front of your face. That's what the enemy does. And so our job is number one is to learn how to discern what the enemy is doing while things are going on around us in chaos. Yes, you may have a marital problem. Yes, you may have job, job issues, but some Something else is behind the storm, stirring, trying to get your attention to keep you from seeing who's creeping in. Why is it creeping in? Why is it coming in? Why does it want to come in? Because its job is to distract you so that you cannot discern what he or she or it is trying to do in your life. So what happens if I don't discern it? Faith comes by. Fearing. Fear does too. Faith comes by hearing, right? Everything comes by hearing. And that's what the enemy wants to do. So the enemy will come in and he starts sifting your life by speaking into your life. And he'll use those that crept in unawaringly. Because some kind of way you trusted who came in. So he uses who you trust to give you a word of knowledge or to give you a new revelation or to give you something that in your, uh, in your pain or in your hurt, you think you need to hear. Now, the scriptures tell us, I believe in Timothy, that a lot of us have itching ears. And we're ready for seducing spirits. So when we're in, when we're in chaos, we're looking for a word. And the first person that shows up are those that crept in. So the Bible says that they crept in unawaring, they crept in unawaringly, they crept in unawaringly. They creep in so that they can speak in to your life. Somebody shout that out, they creep in so they can speak in to our lives. So he says, look, they've come in and I'm here to tell you, I've got a right to you for you to understand. They're trying to break you. 
He says, now, here's the problem. They don't believe God or the Lord to be sovereign. That's number one. That's what it says in the text. Then he says, number two, they are trying to give you cheap grace. Perverted grace. The Bible talks about grace and truth. So yes, there is grace, but there's truth attached to the grace that we don't continue in sins that God forbid. But they are telling you in this new teaching that you can do whatever you want to do. And so this is what they were teaching. They was coming in and they was coming into the church and coming into the church, sliding in like they really needed God. And you got into a place where they were just really surrendering to God and getting up next to you and talking about how good Bishop preached and how he just answered their prayer. And you let them in. And once you got in, they start giving you a new revelation that, that God is not demanding all that from you. God is not speaking. That's old school. God is not saying that. You don't need to do that. That's the time of the past they start speaking all this stuff into them and it started pulling them from the common salvation and so because the times are new people outside of the people in the world are trying to get you to be new and you got to tell them I'm already new I'm made a new creature and I don't have to be what you call me to be I'm going to be what the word calls me somebody shout hallelujah so they start speaking, 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 speaking. They don't believe God to be sovereign. And they've got this perverted grace. There's two things I just gave you right there that can help you determine who has crept into your life. Those that are encouraging you to continue to break the covenant. And then trying to use scripture to tell you that it's okay. And if you don't know the word, then you'll be like Eve and you'll bite and when you bite, you pull yourself away from what God's trying to do. So let's keep going. So what Jude does is Jude comes in, and how does Jude teach them how to deal with this? He says, I'm going to show you how to disconnect from that. And the way you disconnect from it is by giving historical truth. See, that's what the enemy don't want to hit at. The word of God. See, as long as you're talking about your feelings, your friend's going to ride with you. But as soon as you whip out one of them verses and see what happened, they don't want to hear that. Because why? You fight the flesh with the flesh, but you fight the spirit with the spirit. And so when you're dealing with an evil spirit, you don't rise up to fight an evil spirit with your fish. You pull out the word of God. You pull out your prayer language, and that's how you dominate the enemy. Are you here with me tonight? So he starts talking to him, and then he immediately says this. Do you remember what happened to Korah? When they tried to rebel, he opened up the ground, swallowed them. She said, do you remember when the people went across to look at the land, and they decided that we can't take it? What happened? None of them lived to see the promised land. Look at what he's talking to them about. He starts talking about all the different things that has happened when we decide to look for another way to believe God to do something. He starts telling them, trace the word. But what is our world telling us now? You don't need the word and you don't need the tradition. So people are trying to pull you away from tradition. And I get it. I'm not talking about denominationalism when I say tradition. I'm talking about the word of God. Tracing what the word says about your life. We've got away from that. We don't want to do it for ourselves. We wait for our bishop to do it for us. You've got to trace it for yourself. You've got to look into the word of God and see how has God made a way down through the ages? How has God pulled us out of stuff? How has God made a way down through the ages and you can trace God and how God has done things and then you can understand he may not do it this way but he'll do it that way he may not do it that way he'll do it that way he may not use her but he'll use him he may use it he may use that you have to trace the word so we start showing them the word of God now this this is what got me he says when Moses died God didn't tell nobody where the body was. All right? And I love this part. So I got to looking at that. 
And I start tracing it, trying to look at what the rabbis say and oral traditions say. And some of them said that they did not, God did not tell anybody where Moses' body was because Israel, there was no proof that Israel worshiped other people, but they did have a problem with idolatry. Had he left Moses' body where they could find it, because of their mindset, they might have climbed up to where it was and started worshiping Moses. So he didn't tell them where he was. Then one other rabbinical teacher uh, wrote down his thoughts about it, and he said that because the devil is the prince of this world, and, 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 and Moses didn't go to the underworld, and so he waited for Michael to show up because they wanted to tussle over the body. We're gonna take him to the underworld, or we're gonna take him back to heaven. And so when the two of them meet, we see threats from the inside because Michael and Lucifer used to be on the same team. And now the two of them are fighting over a body that has been so influential in pulling people from bondage into freedom. So they're fighting and warring, but the way Michael handles the fight teaches us how you deal with a threat inside. You don't hear about Michael pulling out some angelic weapon and then slicing up Lucifer. All Michael did was say, the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at somebody tell them that's how you deal with a threat inside. You don't have to use your own weapon. Use the one God gave you. He gave you a mouth. He said life and death is in the power of your tongue. I wish I had a witness in here. And you can use your tongue to put the enemy on the run. And he said, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I'm not going to waste my time swinging at you. I'm not going to waste my time cussing at you. I'm going to use the word of God on you. Somebody shout hallelujah. He uses the Lord. Look at somebody say, use the Lord. He uses the Lord. Threats inside. So even the angels had to deal with threats inside. So why wouldn't you have to deal with threats inside. And the enemy knows the only way that he can really get your attention is to get somebody that's on the inside. You're not gonna get mad at John. You're not gonna get mad at Paul, but you sure will get mad at your wife. And you sure will get mad at your son. And you sure will get mad at your daughter. So he uses those that are on the inside to bring a threat against your faith, to bring a threat against your happiness, to bring a threat against your joy. So he can keep you unstable and he can keep you with your mind focused on something else. And while you're focusing on something else, he's coming in on the backside, trying to rob you of everything that you spent all your life praying and fasting for. He gets you all over in this corner, worried about your bills while he's coming in on the backside touching your daughter. It's a threat from the inside. And so he talks to us about it. And all he's trying to do is wreck your faith because faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he'll get in your circle and use people of influence. And in this particular text, he was using false teachers. The greatest way to confuse people who won't study for themselves are those who just only pay attention to the stage. Your entire life about wanting to learn about the Word of God is only predicated off of one day out of the week, Sunday morning. So he'll take that one Sunday and let you have all joy, unspeakable joy, full of glory. But he knows you won't touch your Bible all week until bishops say, open it up and let's look at it again. So he'll use the word that you haven't read and twist it and give it back to you and make you put faith in something that don't even work. Threats from the inside. 
Well, here we are. Well, if, if it's a common salvation, then it's common faith. So if I told you that your faith should be common, don't get upset. Common salvation should be common faith. What does that mean? That what he's preaching, what that Bible is saying, should be common to you. Are y'all not listening to me tonight? I know you don't want to hear it. I know you don't want to hear it. Because healing came with salvation. It should be common, but what keeps it from being common is what keeps into our lives. So because things creep into our lives, it becomes difficult to believe God for something that you've never seen before. But the only way to get you to believe it is that you got to keep listening to it. You got to keep listening to it. You got to keep listening to it. But if you don't move beyond listening, the Bible says you sabotage yourself because you become only a what? Hearer of the word. And if we're going to see miracles in our life, the scripture says that once we hear it, if we don't do it, we're like a man looking in a mirror. And when he turns away from the mirror, he forgets everything that he just saw. The only way he can have memory is for him to put it in his life and to do it. Then his body has memory. And you become the mirror of faith for everybody that's around you. People see you get up from cancer. They see you walk up when you had a situation that took your breath away. They watch you rise. They watch you bounce back. They watch you get up. They watch you walk again. They watch you get happy again. When you were in a position where you felt like you could never come back and you came back, your life becomes the mirror. Look at somebody and tell them, you want to see some faith? Look at me, look at me, look at me. You don't know what I came from. You don't know what I had to go through to get back here tonight. I came through some stuff that tried to rob me of who I am, the very essence of my power, the very essence of who I am. But I came back from it because I got faith. Somebody shout, I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it. I got it. Common salvation. Now here's, now here's, here's what gets me. Let me backtrack. So Moses, I got to go back to Moses. When we hear about Moses again, he's coming down Mount Transfiguration with Elijah, with a body, an immortal body. So we know, we know Satan lost and Jesus won. And it was such a miraculous moment that even Peter was like, yo, let's just build three temples right here because this is incredible because the one that nobody saw buried is in his body coming down this mountain, up this mountain. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Joel, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. If that's the case, Let's look at Elijah for one second so we can grasp the kind of faith you can have. Because they were together. We know the kind of power that Moses had and the kind of power that Elijah had. Oh my God. Calling down fire. He's knocking out 400 prophets by himself. He's got God. But what's miraculous to me about this situation is that in the Bible, the way it describes Elijah, all of that stuff is powerful, that he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that. But the scripture says this, he was a human being just like you. That's what the Bible says. He was a human being just like you and that human being was able to call down fire. That human being had the kind of faith to call down fire. Watch it. That human being just like you had the faith to call down fire. What does that mean? That you got the same measure that Elijah had, that Moses had, that Abraham had, that every Noah had. You, it all starts with the same measure. You got the same measure Bishop Jake's got. But the problem is you got to work your faith. If you don't work it, it ain't going to work for you. You can't put faith in the refrigerator. You can't put it in the storage bank. You got to use it. Touch somebody and say, you got to use it. 
Now some of y'all look at me like, what you mean? No, you can't store it. You have to use it. You have to work it. It's just like a muscle. If you don't work the muscle, the muscle atrophies. You've got to work your faith. And it starts with the small things. It starts with the small things. And then what does Jesus say about faith? When the disciples say, increase our faith. What does he tell them? You just need faith the size of a... You've got way more power than what you think you have. If you would only work what you have, you would be surprised what you could do in this season of your life. And part of your problem is you're waiting on somebody else to say what you need to say to yourself. I wish I had a witness in here. Your own ears need to hear your mouth confess the word of God. Quit waiting on somebody to say it across the stage. Quit waiting on watching it on YouTube. What happens if the internet goes down? You need to hear your own self say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You need to hear your own self say, I am the first and not the last. I am the lender and not the borrower. You got to tell yourself, I am the offspring of God. I don't need nobody to pronounce it over my life. I'll pronounce it over my own life. Faith come by hearing. Am I hearing? Now he says this For we walk by faith and not by. He ain't talking about natural eyes, he's talking about the manifestation of things. So if I'm to walk by faith, you're doing it right now with salvation. You believe you're saved, so you're walking like somebody who's what? Saved. That is the process that you use, that is the common salvation, the common faith that you use to walk as somebody who is a saint. And if you can do it for that, that is the same process you use for everything else in your life. All right? So if we take that process and we make that process applicable to our lives, that doesn't mean everything in your life is going to automatically happen. You created a lifestyle that no matter what happens, you learn how to live by confessing the word of God over whatever comes up against you. And no matter what creeps into your life, no matter what creep attaches himself to your life or her that attaches herself to your life, that will not stop you from speaking the word of God. As soon as you catch that rhythm, it doesn't matter what you inherit. It doesn't matter what comes into your life. Your word ain't going to change. I wish I had a witness here. The word's not going to change because you've caught a revelation that regardless of what I go through, I got a word for it. I wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them, I got a word for it. I got a word for it. Every threat that comes into your life, you got a word for it. May not be comfortable, may not feel good, you may have a headache, but use that word anyway. You gotta whip that word out and learn how to use it. It becomes your trigger to pull in the wall. You don't need a sword, you already got one. It's called the word of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Look at one more person, tell them I got a word tonight. I got a word tonight. You walk out of here, you use that word. You use it on your children. You use it at your job. You use it on your car. You use it on your house. Use it on your mind. Use it on your body. No matter what you go through, you got to learn how to use that word. That's how you walk by faith. Once I get the thing naturally, I don't need faith for it anymore. Because I've already done what? Received it. So, I need faith to get it. Once I got it, I don't need faith for that anymore. I take that same process and I use that process to move into the next season of my life or to deal with whatever has crept into my life. Does that make sense? So he starts talking about that. And then he tells us, this is how you deal with it. Build yourself. You could just stop it right there. Quit waiting for other people to build you. Some of you, the reason why you don't have people in your life, because they're your construction workers. 
Every time you come on their life, they got to build you back up. They got to build you up from depression. They got to build you up because you lost your man. Got to build you up because you lost your job. Got to build you up because you lost your mind. Got to build you up because you lost it. Got to build you up. You're a constant project. And you never become a pillar in nobody else's life. You ought to be a pillar of faith. That when people call you, it's because when they see you, it makes them want to get better because you have survived the times and you've thrived through the times. You have a, com you're a complete testimony of how to go in and come out. Instead of always having to be rebuilt over and over and over, he puts it on you. He says, if you are going to deal with this type of situation, you're going to have to learn how to build yourself. Look at somebody say, build yourself. You gotta quit waiting on people to build you. Build yourself. Build yourself up on your most. Okay, go back. Build yourself up on who, who's, who's holy faith? Can't build on his faith. Can't build on their faith. Can't wait on the teacher. Can't wait on Bible study. Can't wait on Sunday morning. Build yourself. You should be so fired up when you walk in here. It don't matter who preach. It don't matter who sing. It don't matter who usher. It don't matter what music is played. You came in built up. Wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody tell them I came in here built up. I am a miracle. I am a principle. I am what God made. I am the fulfillment of the word. I am the offspring of God. I am a replica of what God says you should look like. I have built myself on my most. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, build yourself right now. Quit telling yourself you ain't going to make it. Stop telling yourself you don't have enough. Quit telling yourself that you ain't going to make it. You can't do it. You can't graduate. You don't have enough money. Build yourself up. If you don't like the way you look, get to working out. I wish I had a witness. Build yourself up. You don't like the money you make? Get another job. Build yourself up. Get another job. Have two jobs. Build yourself up. You can't live off of other people. You've got to build yourself up. I wish I had a witness in here. Oh, can I get at least a hundred of y'all that's building something to just start giving God glory because you're building something. What you building? I'm building myself up. I'm building myself up. Building myself up. Building myself up. Building myself up. I'm building, I ain't building you, I'm building me. I'm building myself up. You got to tell yourself I'm beautiful. You got to tell yourself I'm wonderful. You got to tell yourself you're sexy. You got to tell yourself you're a millionaire. You got to tell yourself you own all the houses. You got to tell yourself I own the whole complex. Build yourself up. What's interesting to me, be seated. What's interesting to me is this. Nobody has to teach you how to build yourself down. Nobody has to tell you how to deconstruct your life. If you don't get what you want, you immediately you run away from God. You run away from church first. You run away from the relationship first. And you start stripping yourself of what it takes to be what God called you to be. The moments that things start crumbling in your life, those are the times that you got to start picking up the pieces. Wish I had a witness here. You got to pick the pieces up. I don't care if you're crying, pick them up. I don't care if snot's coming out your nose, pick them up. I don't care if you feel like you're going to lose it, pick them up. You got to get tough. The Bible says you got to fight the good fight of faith. Glory to God. I wish I had a witness in here. That's how you disarm the enemy. You start building yourself up. When he's trying to break, you start building. And then take the stuff that he stripped off of you and figure out how to use it. Wish I had a witness in here. Use the enemy as your footstool and use him to stick up to the next level. Build yourself. Build yourself. Build yourself. Build yourself. 
I want the praises in here. Only the people that praise God are those that are building. The rest of y'all keep your mouth closed. But those of us that's building, come on and praise him. Come on and give him glory. Come on and work it out. Come on, give God a building praise. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Build yourself. Build your attitude. Build yourself. Build yourself. Be seated. Let me tell you something. When you start building yourself, we can tell. When you start building yourself, you will tell. People will ask you, you know, they ask me all the time, how come you walk like you're big? I am. And I'm not talking about frame, I'm talking about my faith. I wish I had a witness here. It takes faith to make bold moves. It takes faith. It takes faith to make risky moves. And you will never be what you want to be if you don't take a risk. You've got to learn how to step out there, stick your chest out, and be who God called you to be. Let them talk about you. Let them scandalize you. Let them guess. Because in the end, I'm going to win. I wish I had a witness here. I'm going to win in the end. Tell somebody, I'm a winner. Oh, you ain't saying it like you got faith. I want the faith people to shout, I'm a winner. 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 Doesn't matter what the score is. It matters what it is in the end. I wish I had a witness here. The church, the institutional church, the forefathers of the church put strategy together, scripture and dogma to fight off heresy. Not necessary to control. There was some control in it if you go back and research it enough, yes. But things were put in place to fight off heresy because people were coming in teaching all kinds of stuff simply just to pull the people of God away from what God's trying to do in your life. And if he will go through that extreme to sneak into your life, to befriend you and stab you while saying he loves you, then God must really have something in store for you. Because he, even the enemy knows, I can't come in at the door. I wish I had a way. That's how much the enemy actually respects you. He know I can't come in at the door. So I got to get him confused. I got to get him overwhelmed. I got to get him stuck in some drama so I can sneak in the back door and try to work his future over. But touch somebody and tell him, behold, the eyes of the Lord are in all places. Behold, good and evil. In other words, I'm trying to tell you, God's got your back. I wish I had a witness here. He got your back. 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 Got your back. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Watch what he says. Praying in the Holy Ghost. And for years, churches have split, got whole denominations over the weapon that'll help you crush the threat. That's how, that's how the enemy works. So I'll get the church messed up. That's a threat on the inside. So now we can't even depend on each other 
because you believe the Spirit is this, and you believe the Spirit is that, and you believe the Spirit is this, and you believe the Spirit is that, and we can't even come together with one accord and rebuke the enemy. So what he says is, watch it. He said, pray in the Holy Ghost. Use your heavenly language and start talking to God. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. Now, that's praying in tongues. I'm not, I'm not the pastor of the church. I'm an associate. So my job is to just tell you what that book says. Bishop would do all the rest. At the end of the day, praying in tongues is not praying in English. Praying in English is understanding. Praying in tongues is heavenly language. That's between you and God. Me and God is working this thing out. In other words, you're doing the same thing Michael was doing. Wish I had a witness in here. You're using the language that Michael used. What did Michael use? Holy Ghost. Wish I had a witness in here. We know Michael wasn't speaking English. He had to have been speaking God, which I had a witness here. When you learn how to speak God, the devil will flee from you. Tell somebody, speak God, speak God. Use the language of God. Use the language of God. Use the language of God. That's how you drive the devil out. You use God's language. I want you to take some time. If you got a heavenly tongue, take a minute and speak right now. If you can't speak in tongue, speak in English. Come on in here. 20 more seconds. You're speaking God's language. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on in here. Speak God's language. Speak God's language. Come on. Speak that language. Give me some stage. Speak that language. Come on. Speak that language. That's how you handle Glory to God. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor. Oh, no, you got to talk to them in English now. Tell them, neighbor. That's how you build yourself up. Use the language of God. Use God's language. Terrify the enemy. Let hell know I'm not done yet. Let hell know you can't have me. Let hell know it ain't over yet. Let hell know I'm still ticking. Let hell know I'm still in charge. Tell hell I'm feeling what you're giving me. But I still got the power of the Holy Ghost. And it doesn't matter what you send my way. I got enough power to deal with it. Have I got a witness in here? Use your power, Holy Ghost power. Let hell know if you was gonna kill me, you should have already done it. Cause I messed around and got to church tonight and got in the company of believers that's not afraid of the Holy Ghost. And we're gonna speak God's language. Have I got a witness here? Grab somebody by the hand and tell them neighbor, I am going to use what the word says. Have I got a witness here? 
I don't care what hell says. Tell hell I got a word for every dilemma, for every trial, for every situation, for every pain, for every headache. I got a word. Have I got a witness here? Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Put that organ in the house so I can hear it. Have I got a witness here? Grab your neighbor one more time and tell them labor before we get out of here. We gon' let the devil know we too anointed to die like this. We too anointed to be broke like this. We too anointed to suffer like this. We too anointed to go down like this. But since we came here tonight, we are living testimonies. Should have been dead and gone. But I still live and I'm going to live on. Have I got a witness here? Grab one more person and tell them what we're doing right now. We're building ourselves, building our faith, building our joy, building our peace, building our love, building our mind, building our faith, building on things that are eternal, not temporary. It doesn't matter what I feel like. I belong to the king. Have I got a witness here? And I'm stepping into my future, building myself into another level, building myself into another dimension. Say it. Yeah. Stay up there, Justin. Don't come down. When you build yourself up, you're letting the devil know that you still got a praise on the inside. You're letting hell know that it's been tough for me. But it doesn't matter how tough it's been. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. So when you see me, you see the great one inside of me telling me to lift my head, telling me to run on and see what the end's going to be. I felt like throwing in the towel, but some kind of way. My hands lifted, my legs lifted, my heart beating, and out of my mouth, the rivers of living water started coming out. Look at somebody tell them I got something for every threat. Tell them I got a word. He says, discern, disconnect, use the truth, use the ancient truth. Because when you disconnect, you're disconnecting their influence. And the only reason you're listening to them is because some kind of way they've got an influence in your life. So you use the truth to disconnect that influence. Once you do that, you automatically disarm them. Disarming is de-weaponizing them. You take the power from them. Because all you've done is basically told them, I'm turning a deaf ear to what I've been using as fuel for my life. 
There's been a season where I needed what you said, but that season is over. I wish I had a witness here. I don't need to hear you because I'm going to start listening to me. I wish I had a witness here. I'm going to use the word that my Holy Ghost fingers start springing through it, and I'm going to speak the word over my own life. And the last thing, I'm going to leave it right there. After you disarm them, try to save them. Try to save them. Because you're different from them. Our bishop preached about it, how God stuck his hand in the fire while we were on fire. Same thing as in that text. Save them from the fire. You still, has, you still have a responsibility because the text is to the called, not the, not the unsaved. When he said he was writing unto them, he was writing to the called. So there is a higher expectation for the called versus the unsaved. The unsaved will abandon, the unsaved will use trickery. But the called will look past what you did and try to save you anyway. That's what separates you from unrighteousness.